I was a medic and a weed addict and a single mom with two, a daughter and a son. I was in my addiction for 28 years. Can you drop up just a little? This is better. More. I can't hear you. This way? There you go. <laughs> Sorry. I was a meth and weed addict and a single mom with two, a daughter and a son. I was in my addiction for 28 years. Early in those 28 years of addiction, I had three abortions. Before God still blessed me with two healthy children, which confirmed to me I was meant to be a mom. And that terrified me because I didn't want to mess them up because of my addiction and my bad choices. I had a history of bad relationships and I was a bit homeless. Because of my reckless living, I sent my son at the age of 10 to live with their dad in Arizona. My daughter was with me for a short time and at the age of 12, she went to go live with my younger brother and his family. I didn't know how to maintain a home and I was living from place to place. I had been living with my mom and she was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. I was faced with my biggest fear, losing my mom. At that time in my life, my relationship with my family was very broken. During this time, I had a cousin who was clean and sober and came over every day to see my mom. I had a desire in my heart to ask him if I could go to church with him, not knowing anything about church, but I knew I needed some kind of strength. So when I asked him about going to church, my cousin, he called me out. He said, if I flake in any way or embarrassed him to his church family, he would never come back and give me a ride. And he would kick my ass. <laughs> that was my invitation to church. <laughs> so I accepted it on his terms. And I've been at home with my church family ever since. Yeah. Amen. Because of my mom's, my mom's condition was terminal, my sisters Tanya and Denise decided it was best for our mom to live in a quieter place. So she went to live with Tanya. Mom's instructions to the family was that I be allowed to stay in her room and no one was to interfere. My mom had many Bibles, so I began reading one of them. And Psalm 34, 8 stood out to me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. I could see even at that time that he was providing the refuge I needed. My heart started beating differently. As I began going to church, I had asked my mom if I could have her Bible and if she would sign it off to me. And she said yes. On July 22nd, 2009, mom passed away. Before she passed, I had a chance to write her a letter and tell her how sorry I was for all the problems I gave her in life. I also told her how she became a hero to me, how she faced death with such courage and dignity and on her terms. And that helped me to be, not to be so fearful or mad at God. It gave me closure and helped me know it was going to be okay. That night, I went to Bible study. I told the people there that my mom had just passed away that morning, that I was glad to be there because I knew I needed to be with God. Soon after mom passed away, one evening at Wednesday night Bible study, I shared with the ladies that I was going to have to move. One of the ladies invited me, a broken stranger with a secret addiction in her home. So this was part of God's plan for me to take the next step. Shortly thereafter, I moved into her home. I was secretly using meth and afraid of her finding out. I would read my Bible wired all night because I had nothing else to do. The book of John is the love letter God gave to me that opened my heart. The next verse that just blew my mind was John 10.10, 10, which
which says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I thought, who is this thief? And I wanted to know about this abundant life. I began to notice every Sunday and Wednesday that I would cry because God was really speaking to my heart. I was afraid of what was happening inside. And I didn't know what was going to look like on the outside. I had no idea where this journey was going to take me. And then I felt convicted of my secret. Because that's what the word God does. Then it was uh, John 8, 36 revealed to me. But I was writing, but as I was writing this testimony, I was reminded of verses 35 and 36 together. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So I was that slave to the sin of addiction. And I had no permanent place with my family or my church family, but a son or daughter of God belongs to it forever, a permanent place. So the Lord wanted me to see the important connection between verses 35 and 36. And as I reflected on why John 8, 36 stood out to me, I had no examples around me of someone walking in freedom because I came from the streets and there's no freedom out there. And the Lord himself told me to watch my pastor and his wife. As I began to watch, I started to recognize that there was a deep fear because I knew I had to confess my secret to him. And that fear had a hold on me. The fear was, once I told him my secret, he would tell the woman who invited me in to remove me from her home immediately and reveal my secret. But I wanted to be free, and the Bible tells us to confess. So I took a chance and I braced myself and sent him an email telling him what was happening to me and my secret. As I waited anxiously for him to reply, I had so many thoughts running through my head. Then I started to think how quick it would be, how quick it would take for me to pack my stuff. He replied within the same day, and I will never forget what he said. And it was what he didn't say that meant the most. And it was this. There's a Celebrate Recovery Program at First Baptist Church in Stockton. And they have meetings every Thursday at 7 p.m. and I needed to go. And he never said a word to anyone. And that was God's grace and God's heart demonstrated to me in that moment. April 9, 2011 is the day Jesus delivered me from myself and addiction to meth. Amen. 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 Praise God. I had an old friend that I would check in with on a regular basis. One day, I stopped at his house to check on him. He opened his door and said, come on in, Rose. We're having a bubble study. I knew what kind of bubble study he was having, and that was okay, because I was going there to show Jesus with him anyway, you know? And so I went in, and I was visiting with his guest. He stepped into the room with a bag in his hand and, and waited and said, look, Rose, here's some good stuff. And I replied, Get thee behind me, Satan. You no longer have a hold on me. And my friend turned and walked out of the room. When he returned to the room later, it was like he never even brought it up. I realized then it no longer had a hold on me. And for that, I'm immensely grateful to God for his deliverance. Here I am in 2021, and God continues to build my story and helps me to overcome so many things as they come up. And I'm here as evidence of God's love, sovereignty, sufficiency, and power. And I'd also like to close with this. Along this journey, as God has helped me, He has helped me to help others. And uh, in areas of addiction, especially in my family. And He's given me a heart for the homeless and for the lost and the broken. And so he's given me the gift of time. And so I, in this time that I have now, I like to give back and go out and, and share it with these people and with my family and, and just share my story. And, and 
let them know I can relate to them and uh, share the same love that he lavished on me, lavish on them. And thank you for having me come and share my story. Thank you.